I'm Mario Martinez Jr., CEO and founder of Ingresso, and we are the creators of FlyMessage.io, the free personal writing assistant and text expander application. On each episode of this podcast, you will hear from sales leaders, practitioners, and influencers to help you grow your sales numbers at scale. So get your pen and paper or iPad and keyboard and start taking notes as you're now listening to The Modern Selling Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Modern Selling Podcast, and I'm stoked. Why? Because we're on episode number 249. 249. We are one away from our 250th episode of the Modern Selling Podcast. It's been an amazing, solid six years of bringing this podcast to all of you listening in. Now, today, I've got a very special guest, and in this case, we're coming from the research side of the house. I've got with me a uh, book author as well as CEO of the Nucleus Research. And we're gonna be talking about the value sale ROI and how to bring value back to our buyers uh, so that we can make more sales. Ian Campbell, welcome to the show. Mario, thanks for inviting me, really appreciate it. You got it, buddy. Well, I appreciate you joining me and everybody listening in. Do me a favor, tell us a little about yourself, a little background. And then a little bit about Nucleus Research, and then I want to talk about the book, and I got a special question for you. Sure. Um, well, I've uh, I've been in tech for a while, and uh, started really as an old software programmer, but uh, moved on to research. And Nucleus has been around for a little over twenty years now, and we focus on value. What is the return on investment from technology? We help the typical folks at a research firm would vendors and end users, folks who are buying technology to understand and articulate a value message. What is the ROI from technology and been doing it for a while? Fantastic. And uh, Nucleus Research, tell us a little bit about that. Nucleus Research, like uh, other typical research firms, we look at the different market areas and uh, really our spin is not so much what we think, but what we found. We do a lot of ROI case studies. We go out and investigate how did somebody get value from deploying a new CRM system or understanding and deploying a new scheduling system or should I pick this ERP system over another? We ask them, we answer the numbers question, if you will, instead of the who's on the short list, we tell you who's the best for you. And really we're here to help those vendors to push that message out to their customers or their prospects. And then we help folks who are buying technology choose the product that's right for them. And usually one size doesn't fit all. So what's going to give them the greatest return as opposed to who's at the top of some list. Fantastic. Well, thanks for uh, joining us. And, uh, you know, I used to have folks from CSO Insights, uh, formerly that was acquired by Miller Hyman, which was then acquired by Corn Ferry, and then they dismantled it. Uh, and so we haven't had a research firm uh, in a while, and it was CSO Insights, and there's a couple of other, uh, other ones out there, and uh, oh my gosh, the, the names are escaping my brain right now. But nonetheless, uh, so it's good to be able to bring this context back to the sales community. Now, before we begin and start getting deep down into some of the, the topics here that we want to talk about, I do have a very special question for you, and that is, uh, tell us something nobody knows about you, even if they're looking at any or all of your social profiles. Well, boy, uh, so I, I secretly love Huskies. Uh, we foster them uh, here in the office, and, I, and I'm constantly saying, no, I don't, you know, don't, don't need dogs, and I get it. And, and we foster them a little bit, let them go. But secretly, it seems like every dog we, we foster, I want to keep. So we're constantly rotating dogs through, although honestly, I don't want one, but I secretly do. So don't tell my wife that, or we'll be... Uh, inundated by huskies so we'll foster we'll let them go but secretly i think we're gonna end up keeping one of these well you actually get the feeling of having a dog but then you know in the back of your mind that you don't have to keep the dog <laughs> <laughs> so it's like that that committed non-committed but it's actually a big thing it's a huge time investment to be able to foster uh, an animal and to take care of them and get them to a healthy condition where somebody else can take them yeah yeah, I, you know what, I, we, we're going to talk about ROI. I'm not sure it has the best ROI given the amount of TV remotes I've had to purchase over the last couple of years, uh, couches and various things that they've gone through. You always get a foster that's got an issue and then 
comes in and it takes a little while. So you sort of get the tough part where they uh, they eat various expensive equipment. But uh, you're right. It's a it's a great thing. But uh, I am going to continue to tell everybody I don't want to keep any, but I think we'll end up keeping one. Fair enough. Well, the, thank you for sharing that. Now, a little bit about the book, The Value Sale. Talk a little bit about why did you write it? What's it all about? And then we're going to get into some uh, some deep dive topics here. So we we look at value. That's a big part of our company. It's what we focus on. And I've been teaching value and ROI f- at the the college level for some time. And it's funny writing a book. I've started that it, it started a couple of times. And the whole goal was to give salespeople. We've trained thousands of salespeople over the years. We really give salespeople a way and a process to build a business case. You know, we find that a lot of folks think of ROI as, as a mountain to get over in sales. How do I prove value? And, you know, a lot of salespeople will hold back and say, well, maybe I can dodge the question until somebody really needs an ROI business case. And, you know, it's not as hard as it seems. And, I, you know, laying it out in this very simple way is what we uh, what we wanted to do and what I wanted to do with the book. So a couple of false starts took a little while, but uh, I was able to uh, sit down and, and get that done and get it to a point where I think it takes people beginning to end and how to build that business case and how to deliver uh, a message that will help close a deal. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, I want to talk about this whole concept of value. And oftentimes we think in the concept of ROI. Now you talk about this in your book, uh, The Value Sale. Um, You say in your book, there's an easy way to tell if a project will generate a positive ROI. Let's talk about that first. Sure, sure. Um, so if if I start with ROI, first kind of the why. Why do you want to do ROI? And one of the things I, I tell folks is if I told you you could raise, you could make money uh, by raising baby alligators in your bathtub, would you do it? And the answer is no, and then it's yes. Right? Tell how much. How much money are we going to make? And if I said you'll make $5 million a year by raising baby alligators in your bathtub, you say, sure, I'll do it. Um, but I didn't tell you anything about the product. So uh, ROI is really valuable because it helps the customer understand the return they're likely to get, and that will help them drive themselves through the sales funnel. If I know there's a positive ROI, raising baby alligators, for instance, then I'm likely to buy a lot of baby alligators, even though I know nothing about the product. So the, the, the easier it is to build a business case, build an ROI case, the easier it's going to be for you to sell. So what are those what are those little keywords? I think if you walk into a deal, there are two things I can look at that will tell me if this deal is going to be, this prospect is going to get positive value. Consider breadth and repeatability. How often is a customer going to use your product and how many of their uh, users will use it? So how many people will your product touch and how often will you touch them with your product? The more people use it, the more often they touch it, the greater the potential ROI. So think about a CRM system used by every sales rep every day. A lot of repeatability every day, a lot of salespeople. High potential value. So I can walk into that deal and say, this is likely to be good for the customer even before anything. If I'm selling, say, an onboarding system where I bring people on to the company and they pick which 401k plan, it's usually done once when the person starts with the company. So done once by only one person each time, right? It's done by everybody only once. Low repeatability, breath, but low repeatability. The greater the repeatability, the greater the breath, better off you're going to be. And it really depends on the customer. So if you're selling a CRM, and I don't want to stick with CRM system, if you're selling a CRM system, for instance, if I sell to a big company with a lot of salespeople, likely to have high potential value. If I'm selling to a company with only one salesperson, likely to have low potential value. So even before you start a deal, think about, hmm, breath and repeatability, is this likely to give value to the prospect? And I'm going to know if this is going to be an easy sale or if I'm going to have to really push to create a value message for the customers so they understand that, hey, I'm charging you a lot, but you're going to get a lot back. That lot back really depends on breath, repeatability, how often and how many people. Hmm, Interesting. Uh, So should we always be leading with this topic of ROI um, in a sales process? Or is that the the one of the major criteria for, for purchasing? So, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. And in fact, if you look at the metrics, right, we all talk about ROI, ROI, and, and, and that's kind of the key metric everybody talks about. But I'm going to tell you a trick. Payback is actually better. So if you're going to talk about financial me- metrics, talk about how long until the customer is going to cover their value. 
or cover their cost? How much return are they going to get over what amount of time? So I can tell you the ROI from a project will be 200%, and that's okay. But if I tell you it will cover its cost in six months, I feel that. So as a salesperson, lead with payback. Hey, if, if you buy this new combine, for instance, you'll be able to plow more fields and you'll cover the cost of the combine in two years. Feels better than it's got a 50% return on investment because I feel a time period more than I feel an ROI number. So just a little trick to lead with payback and then follow up with ROI. But the broader question of are metrics the best thing to start with, you know, often they are a really good thing to start with, uh, but there could be other reasons why people buy, and there's always different value propositions of whether it's obligatory or trying to avoid fines in some way, or I just like it in some way, uh, which doesn't tend to happen in professional sales. But if you lead with value, like alligators, you can usually close the deal if you can show a value proposition. Even if they're not so sure they want baby alligators, they're likely to buy a whole bunch of them if they think they'll get a positive return on that project. Now, this is a very rare moment. It's episode number 249, so I might as well do it. I'm actually going to share my screen and show you something. And for those of you that are listening in, you know that we have a SaaS product called Fly Message, flymsg.io. And it's a productivity app, Ian, that helps to save time for the mundane, repeatable messages uh, that we use every single day. Example, someone wants to book a meeting with me, Ian. I usually type out, yes, no problem, Ian. Let's go ahead and schedule a discussion. Here's my calendar link. Uh, go ahead and click that here and we can schedule something. Well, that usually takes me anywhere between one to two minutes because I usually have to type that out, then go find the calendar link, copy that and paste it in. And then that takes me one to two minutes. Now, if I'm a salesperson, I'm doing that every single day. I'm obviously wasting time. Add to that any type of message that we might use. And the data shows that 85% of all uh, knowledge workers, some of this is behind a computer every day, 85% uh, use a repeatable snippet of a message or message at least multiple times per week and 65% at least multiple times per day. So to that point, I'm, I'm going here, I'm gonna share my screen. And for those of you that only listen to the audio cast, I'll voice narrate this for you. I'm gonna share something with you. And I want you to talk about, when we, or I want you to help me analyze this concept of ROI. Because we talk about it in the large, huge enterprise sales, which I've done global, national, $120 million contracts, right? But now what about in the context of a product-led growth model even, where we're talking about literally the product costs $27 at its low end and $133 or $32 on the high end, right? On a yearly basis. So uh, let me let me show you this. And up in front of you should pop up right about now, our share screen. So for, for those of you that are listening on the audio cast, you can't see what I'm showing. But what I'm showing is the Fly MSG dashboard. And on that dashboard right here, Ian, we've got for someone who uses our product, in this case, me, that we've typed out over 3 million characters over the last 12 months for them. We've literally typed 3 million characters on a LinkedIn, CRM, Salesforce, email, wherever it might be. We literally have saved that uh, this person, me, 287 hours from typing, and that equals a cost savings of $9,098.11 over the last 12 months. Now, this product cost me $132 a year. So the way we showcase this to our end users is, hey, if we're actually saving you money, saving you time, is that worth something? This is that ROI discussion I think that you're talking about, even on the most simplest products of products, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And this is exactly how we would approach it and how you should approach it. You're increasing the productivity for the end user and you're doing it in the exact right, right reason. You have high repeatability, you're touching a lot of people, you're doing it with a very reasonable price product and you're saving a tangible thing, which is time. Now, even if you say, uh, boy, you save me 200 hours, I believe only three hours, still enough to justify the cost. So you would do a worst case of this and say, how many hours do I really need to save you to justify the money, to justify the cost? I don't need to save you that much, just a few hours. You're going to cover your cost. If it's 290 hours in a year, you're going to cover your cost in the first five days um, because you're probably spending that much time. So anything you can do to increase the productivity of employee is likely to generate high value. Now, if you think about benefits, benefits go from 
most people think of them as hard and soft. And what you should really think of them as four different categories. I have a benefit that's a direct category, save a cost. I have a benefit that's an intended category. I expect to save a cost. I have a productivity gain, which is this. And then I have sort of a distant benefit. Because we're using your product, I'm likely to have happier sales reps because they don't have to do the repetitive thing anymore. That's likely to reduce the, the turnover of sales reps. I may keep one extra sales rep just because they're not frustrated anymore because they're using the best. They don't have to do the mundane thing anymore. So my turnover will go down a little bit. Well, that's sort of a distant benefit. But from a ROI point of view, we go from really believable to not believable at all. And this would be what we'd call a third order benefit, high degree of variability, but you've got such a high number that even with that bell curve makes perfect sense. So 290, what I did was exactly what you should, which is say, boy, let's do the worst case. Even at the absolute worst case, makes no sense not to do it. So in this case, doing the worst case analysis, what do we expect, 290, what do we actually see? Even if it's only three, it's still great. So that turns out to be a good enough number to justify going forward with the project. That's exactly the value proposition you should be using in sales. Also, what you really did was clean, focused on that one number, how many hours. And you know, if we look at a deal, it's usually only one or two things that drive a deal and then two or three, three things that support it. If you go over five, you've made a mistake. So you've got the one big one, productivity. But I just wanted another one, reduced employee turnover. That's too small. I don't care, right? Happier employees, eh, whatever, right? It's too small. Yeah, I care if they're happy. I don't really, you know, it doesn't matter. But, but the impact on the company is tiny compared to those first two. The first one, the first two, that's 90% of your ROI. Then it tapers off to something tiny after that. So focus on those two big benefits. Close the deal on those two big benefits. That's what you should do. That's what you put all your energy behind. The rest of the stuff, that's good to have. Yeah, it's great. But it's not going to drive the business case forward. Those two big ones, those will. Um, so I, I, I'm actually going to credit this to you, Ian. Um, so I've been looking at our marketing sequences and looking at how, how can we drive a, from a 4% to a 5% to, or 5% to a, to an, a 7% conversion rate, just 1%, right? Conversion rate and product led growth. This is what we're always thinking about, right? How do I convert more people? Yeah. And, and so, um, I've been sitting here racking my brain and we've been showing the data to the end user. We've been sending it out and saying, oh, look how many hours we saved. Look how many, uh, how much is you saved in productivity, yeah? But I have failed to bring it together with this question that you just stated. And so this is going to go to the great Ian Campbell here. How many hours do I really need to save you in order to justify the cost? That's it. And I think that's such a brilliant question to start out a, a an email with when we're looking at these sequences is like, what is that worth to you? And then let's back that into a freaking $132 annual fee. Like, give me a break. <laughs> right. Right. And you know, it's, it's funny about a business case because what will happen is people will think I've got to create the perfect, perfect business case. I've got to show what the 290 uh, would be worth to somebody. And you don't remember, you're just trying to close a deal. I just need to get over that hurdle. If somebody says, and you can look at it and say, I'm obviously going to save four or five hours. I know that just, just even if I'm completely wrong, I know it's going to save me a few hours. Of course, it's going to save me a lot more than that. I just need to get over that hurdle. And that pushes the decision forward. So sometimes it's a lot easier to back into, can I get you over that hurdle to show you that it's just an obvious win, despite the fact that there's a lot more behind that. Uh, love it. Brilliant. Well, um, uh, FYI, I'll be taking that and bringing that into our marketing sequences there. Uh, you know, but but this topic around ROI, it's difficult for a salesperson to have. And especially I always feel like, you know, when we were in, when I was selling into the mid markets and the majors, and especially in the public sector and federal, oh my gosh, even there, it's all about ROI on public sector and federal, right? Always about return on investment. Um, I, I always found it very difficult to unpack this topic. Yeah. And it mainly because I always felt like the organization lacked tools to be able to help me prove out an ROI not just on the cost savings by switching from one provider to another, right? That, 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 that's that, but the intangible elements, like as the example in fly message, there's a productivity savings. If I'm typing out 3 million characters a year for you, what have you gained in terms of ROI? In this case, time, time is money, right? So you've got to back into that. So I always find it difficult in these larger opportunities or enterprise products, uh, so long winded statement to be able to say ROI can be difficult topic. Simplify for me. 
All right, let's let's make it a little bit easier by putting it to little chunks. So, um, uh, or straightforward chunk. Let's put it in categories here. So, if you think about value, there are only three things I can do for the customer. Only three things: I can increase their productivity, I can reduce cost, or I can, as a byproduct of those two, increase profitability. Now, in general, increasing profitability, increasing revenue, it's a tough one to do. So if you say to somebody, how much more money will you make with these extra hours? That's a leap. How much can I save? So let's say I can save enough to, I can save five hours. What's five hours worth? It's your fully loaded cost divided by 2080 gives you the five hours. So I know what the value of my five hours is worth. I can't really look at the output. So if all I can do is increase cost and increase productivity, or reduce cost, that's absolutely fantastic for me. So tying everything to that in some way is really what I want to do. Um, when I'm calculating ROI, it's really straightforward. All I want to do is look at what are those benefits and use that that four category framework of something that's really believable, something that's sort of believable, something that's a productivity gain, and something that's a long-winded story I can't get my arms around. So. I cut a cost, I intend to cut a cost, I increase productivity or impl happier employees. All right, good way to think about it. Once you get to happier employees, you've lost the deal. Don't even talk about it. I'm glad your employees are happy, but that's a long-winded story to say, I'm selling you an acorn and you can build a house with it. Nah, you're selling me an acorn, don't talk about the house. It's because that's a big leap to what I can do with the output of something. So if we frame it with, let's go, go, to, go with those really strong things, and we need to cut a cost and then how do we uh, put put a case study or a data point around it? So for for your uh, solution, do we have any anecdotal data that says, "Hey, I saved X amount of hours"? You know, can we get some customers that then talk about the number of hours they saved, and then we can sort of lead to payback? So the average person covers their cost in the first thirty days. That would be a great data point. So how do we support that? Um, but ROI is really a number you already know. If you walked into a bank, you put money in a bank. You know what the return is. It's not more complicated than that. And often we turn it into a big consulting project. We bring in a value engineering team. We think it's something huge. It's really not. It's very straightforward. How much money do you, do you spend up front? What's the benefit each year? And it could be productivity gain or reduced cost. And then divide it by what you spent. And that's it. That's the whole ROI number. You already know it. Put $100 in the bank, you get $5 back, 5% return on investment. Easy calculation. So I think you know, if there's anything about ROI, it's don't be scared of it. It's actually, you already know it. You just don't realize you know it. And there are some people that are, you, know, you probably may realize you know it, but people will turn into a big consulting project and it doesn't need to be that. If you bring consultants in, you're probably making a mistake. You can do this yourself if you just weave value into your discussion. Uh, great answer. Uh, you do talk a little bit about that there's something even more important than the ROI. And that is payback. So first, let's define what is payback, and why do you say it's more important than ROI for for a salesperson? Yeah. So a good trick for salespeople, and what we've learned over all these years of working with salespeople, is you know ROI gets a lot of the marketing, if you will. We all talk about ROI. What's the ROI from the project? But if I told you something had an ROI of two hundred percent, you sort of intellectually know what that is. I know that's good. But if I told you that it, the project covers its cost in six months, you feel it. You know what six months is, right? If you think about a CFO or a financial decision, you think about your prospect. Your prospect, you're selling to your prospect, your champion, and they're selling through to somebody else saying, this is why I should buy the product. That person behind them, they're a no person. They're not a yes person, right? And they're always someone who doesn't want to do something. So that person has to be convinced that the project isn't risky. And the way you do that is to say, Look, worst case, it covers its cost in six months. Isn't this great? Go back to your solution. Covers its cost in a week, two weeks, 30 days. Look, if I absolutely hate it, I've covered my cost in 30 days. I can throw it away and I'm still up. Doesn't matter. It's an easy sale. In fact, I would argue it would be silly for me to go three months trying to decide if I should do it. I would have already covered my cost. Why would I do that? Do it, deploy it. If I don't like it in three months, I can still throw it away. I've covered my payback. So a good trick for salespeople is lead with, this will cover its cost in five months, six months, whatever the number is, and then follow up with, with an effective ROI of 300% or 200%, whatever the number is. Lead with payback, follow up with ROI, and you'll see people can internalize that a lot better than leading with ROI. Mm. 
I love the idea here of reframing the discussion in the in the sales um, in the in the sales motion or sales discussion with the buyer, and that is this will pay itself back in put, fill in the blank, and that will lead to an ROI of fill in the blank, right? Um, and you're right because when I think about the whole ROI, it's your return on investment is a three hundred percent against what you paid versus you know what the ROI would be. And most people, as I think about that, that's my brain says, oh, okay, let me see what that means. And I start trying to think like, what does that mean? But if someone said to me, this is going to cost you $100,000 and it's going to pay, pay itself back in four months, I'm like, oh, well, immediately I've got eight months worth of positive ROI. Bingo. That's exactly it. I can easily do that math in my head and make it more, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, I could understand this concept quicker, faster, better to make a better buying decision. You feel it. It's more consumable for the prospect. And then remember you're selling through your prospect to somebody else. So what's the first thing that person's going to say when they pitch your product? Don't worry, boss. It'll cover its costs in six months. We should sign the chat, the contract for this. Don't worry, boss. It's got a 300% ROI. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. Right? Uh, I love it. That's a brilliant. So right. Uh, but that's exactly the question. Like, what's the payback period? Like, it's going to cover itself in four months. Or it will have a 300% ROI. Huh? What does that mean? <laughs> that's exactly what I would say. Like, well, I don't understand. What does that mean? 300% ROI against what? Well, how much are we talking about? Like, then you start forcing yourself to drill down through the numbers. But when you talk about a payback period, it, like, you instantly know, like, is this going to pay back? Is, if it's going to take 10 months, 12 months, 24 months, then I better be signing a long-term contract. And, and and now that helps me figure out like, well, how long is this contract for? Because it takes me 11 months out of 12 just to get a, a, a payback. I'm like, that's probably not a very good scenario there, right? Right. And as, um, as a market tightens, what you'll find is uh, that folks will be hesitant to make a decision. So if I say it covers this cost in six months, then my boss, the decision maker knows, your neck is only on the line for four months, then it's covered its cost. So if I make a bad decision, ah, likely I'll cover my cost for the decisions uh, terrible. And I can make a terrible decision. And if we use it for a year, I've still covered my costs and move on. So it's a really good way to get rid of the risk in the project and make it more likely to go forward. Another really good trick is to say, again, we'll cover your costs in four months. Make the decision today. In four months from now, you're already positive. If we spend four months deciding, you would have covered your costs already. So it starts to accelerate just a little bit. The deal makes it worthwhile to get going. The shorter the payback, the easier it is to say, go forward with this. We'll cover our costs. We'll start generating, generating positive value for the company. So payback is that, that secret tool that will help unlock the hesitation that your prospect might have. Bro, all I got to say is, is um, I'm taking some great notes because now my brain is, is firing right now on all cylinders in terms of marketing messaging. Uh, pricing page, product pages. Like, what do we have on there? For example, on one of our product pages for the uh, for sales professionals, we have the Flymaster Sales Pro, and on there it says for only thirty six cents a day you can have this. And I'm like, after just talking about this with you, I'm like, why are we talking about thirty six cents a day? Who who cares about that? You'll get a payback period. Our top users within two weeks. Within two weeks, have already paid uh, themselves back and in lost productivity. A quick and a quick survey. What we would recommend is quick survey to 500 customers saying how much did you save, and you can say 90% of our customers cover their costs in the first 30 days. It's likely true for you. I I don't doubt it. Just looking intuitively, it's probably in those kind of numbers. But when you've got numbers like that, it's a lot stronger. 36 cents a day. Eh, I I. I can sort of get my hands around. That's a cost. It's not a benefit. A benefit is I've covered my cost of getting money back. That's a benefit. Uh, uh, I'm, 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 my, my mind is like uh, whew, right now. Uh, I, I want to get back to, to go looking at those marketing landing pages and just uh, start ripping them apart, Ian. This is really good. This is r really, really good, actually. It's all, not to pitch my book, it's all in the book to sort of frame just these little minor tricks and how you do it. You're doing it anyway. You're building the business case anyway. You've got the numbers. All you got to do is just tweak how you say it. Yeah, fair. Well, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes a sales rep can make when building the business case or a business case? 
Yeah, I mean, it's probably two things uh, that we see salespeople uh, maybe tripping over themselves on. One, you know, of course, to be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. But but the first one is too many benefits. Start to throw all those benefits onto the pile. Think that more benefits is better, and it isn't. Your business case is as strong as the weakest link. So stick with those one or two that really matter, and then forget the other ones. Again, here in this case, productivity gain, strong, believe it, intuitive, I can see it. it, takes me zero time to see the value it's going to deliver, so that ROI becomes really good. All the other stuff doesn't matter. Good rule, if you've gone over five, you've absolutely made a mistake. Don't do it. You know, also kind of bringing in those value engineering teams where they start to turn a project into a big consulting effort. This shouldn't be a consulting effort. You should be able to sit over dinner with somebody and say, let's talk about the big benefits you're likely to get. Reframe those as numbers. Gee, you're likely to increase productivity by at least 5%. What could that mean for your company? And then try to close the deal with those one or two big benefits. Um, if we look at the sales funnel, and not to go off a little bit, but think about the typical sales funnel. The, the, the mistake that salespeople will make is ignore value until it's brought up. So we see too many people say, I'm just not going to talk about ROI until somebody else mentions it. And then if they do, I'll bring in some expert that may be able to help me with this. I'm going to try to ignore it. Think about that sales funnel. The sales funnel in whatever form you have starts with bring a lead in and then work that down to a close, right? We all know the typical sales funnel. Think about the sales funnel as having two sides. The side you already know, the side you're already working through, the side that's in your CRM system, right? I'm going to move people. But there's another side. Think about the other side of the sales funnel as having a value message. There are three steps to that value message. First step is, here are all the different ways we deliver value. So we bring somebody, we bring a lead in, you're talking to the customer for the first time, and you say, you're talking to a prospect for the first time, and you say, here are the five different things we do. Here's all the different ways we deliver benefits for the customer, the big picture. Then you start to qualify that customer, bring them into the funnel. What they're going to want to see are other customers like themselves that are using the product that have achieved value. Here are four other salespeople in pharmaceutical, just like you, that are using our product to help generate auto responses and look at the value that they've received. So whether it's case studies or references or numbers that you've used. So big picture, how have others like them achieved value? How are they ach will achieve value? If we only increase your productivity by two hours a week, what does that mean for you? So here are all the different ways to deliver value. Here are the people, here are other people that have achieved value with us. Here how you will, here's how you will achieve value. And so as you go through the funnel, make sure you're bouncing back and forth. You're going through the funnel on the lead generation, bring the lead in. You're talking about all the ways to deliver value. You're qualifying that lead. You're bringing them in, that, that prospect. You're talking about other prospects like them, other customers like them, pharmaceutical, manufacturer, whatever it is, that can that have achieved value. You're closing the deal and you're talking about a value message. So value isn't a point, value is a message you weave throughout the discussion. And if you start early on, you're going to find that the end becomes very, very simple and you'll accelerate the deal through. The quicker people see value, the more they want to take the step and get, get going. Like, you know, if I can cover my cost in four months, I want to get going now. Great idea. Beautiful. And uh, looking at this concept of value, where does value fit in the sales funnel? Yeah, so so value really is that message you weave. Like I said, sort of those three steps. Let me start by talking about it. You already know. You think back at the customers you've already closed. What the, think about the last four or five customers you have and say, what's the one thing they did? What's the one big winning thing they did with my product? That's all you need to know, just one. And now you've got that in the back of your head. So now the next time you walk into a customer, you can say, by the way, the person down the street was able to use our product to do this with it. And it's something quantifiable, whether it's a KPI or reduction cost, whatever it is, right? And then you move them down and say, let me connect you to them so you can talk to them. And here's a good trick. Think about those, you know, we all have references, but think about those references you have, those one or two people you rely on, those secret references you keep that you know you can call on. Make sure the next time you t chat with them, you frame the benefits that they receive. So you ask them, how did you get value? And they'll say, well, hey, we reduced our cost by 20%. Great. Now, next time you're using them as a reference, they've got that in their head because you talked it through with them. And now they know 20%, right? We re reduced it by 20%. They might not know this, but it makes them a better reference. So now I'm getting through stage two. Now I'm getting to them and I say, if we only reduce your cost by 20%, we justify your, 
you know, the, the product or whatever, whatever the value statement is. And you may find you don't even need to build a business case. Just walking through with those benefits might be enough to drive the deal forward. Beautiful. I'm sitting here and I'm looking back and I'm looking at, uh, all right, how can I rephrase, free, re, rewind? How can I reframe this even in my sales prospecting messaging, right? Um, and that's pretty interesting because even on our website, we have um, the percent of, um, of uh, the ROI. It was an ROI discussion that we showed that they got a, I forget what the number was, 3,653% ROI. But what the heck does that actually mean? Or what, what does that actually mean? When I look at the website, I think about that. I'm like, hmm, what does that mean? Like to an end, I know because I know the numbers. The customer, I think, knows now that we did the program because they know the numbers. But from a marketing standpoint, what is a non-party, a, a non-participating non party, what, what does that mean to them? Three thousand, No, rather um, that they would have paid this back, in this case, within 30 days. Right, like I, that, that. That's a bit. It's a. It's a. It's a mindset shift here that I'm going through. Even when it comes down to marketing messaging. Yeah, and yeah, that's exactly what it is. And this is how you tie marketing to sales. Once you start thinking about how you're selling, you go back to your marketing message and say, "Am I supporting marketing with those right, clean messages?" So another one you could use would be, "We eliminate 98 percent of the time spent on repetitive tasks." Simple, right? Uh, maybe probably do because I don't have to do that. So that it's a, it's usually, you have to be careful, it's a multiple or a percentage, things like, if you if you use a number, we we save you $300,000 a year, hard for people to get their hands around because that just matters for one company. Other company could be a high number or a low, 300,000 be higher or low. But if you use a percentage, 10X return, uh, five month payback, ROI is a good one, but not necessarily as strong as, as the we eliminate kind of numbers. So there are a bunch of ways to do it, but think about, how is the customer receiving uh, that message, and is it that simple? ROI is a tough one. It's a great message for a CFO. Terrible message for everybody else. Fair, fair, absolutely. Now, you mentioned in the book, The Value Sale, that there are ultimately uh, only three things that you can do for a customer. We only got a few minutes left on the show, but what what does that mean and what are those three things? Yeah, it's just that. Keep in mind, all I can do is reduce cost, increase productivity, or increase profitability. And what that means is that we've all seen those features function list where I've got a feature and a benefit, right? Feature, benefit, feature, benefit. And usually what you see is a feature and then a restated feature is the benefit. And so what you should think about is we increase productivity. And here are all the features in our product that increases productivity. So let's say you've got a new revision of your product that's coming out. We're launching a new version. And here are all the really cool things it does. But you're asking the customer to figure out, well, these things will translate into what for me? I understand that the new UI is, is pretty, but what does that mean? Well, we've done these five things to increase productivity. We've done this six, these six things to reduce your costs or these four things to make it easier for your IT people, which will ultimately increase their productivity. So take whatever it is that you have as a feature and roll it up into reduce costs. Here's how, again, go back to, to your solution. Here's how all the things that we do ultimately drive increased productivity for salespeople. So everything drives to that kind of one of these three things, increase, uh, increase productivity, reduce cost, or as a byproduct of that, increase revenue and profitability. So talk about features to that benefit, make sure those benefits drive to those big numbers. That's really it. If you think about it, it's just only doing three things, it makes it a lot easier to say, I know the product does a lot, but ultimately it really only impacts the customer in three different ways. That's all it does. That's where you have that image where uh, you're on stage and you take the microphone and drop the mic. <laughs> Drop the mic. Hey, great stuff, Ian. That's really great stuff. If somebody wants to connect with you, if they want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Is it Twitter? 
wait, not like, what, what is it called now? X? Is it X, Twitter? I don't know, you're not supposed to call it anymore. LinkedIn, you tell us. Yeah, so LinkedIn's a great way to find me. Please find me on LinkedIn, Ian Campbell, uh, Nucleus. Uh, and, you know, that's obviously a great way. Come to Nucleus Research. We've got a lot of great research available. A lot of it uh, is free to help you out. We're easy guys to work with. So you can send me an email, Ian at Nucleus. Uh, research or hello at Nucleus Research. And go to thevaluesale.com if you want. If there's a lot of articles uh, uh, up there uh, on things like IRR, for instance, which is a very complex topic, but we can boil it down to it's a bad idea. Don't use it. But we can show you why. And if you really want to use it, I can show you how to cheat with it. So stuff like that, I think we've got a lot of great content up there that people can use. And the whole goal here is to help you as a salesperson, as a marketing person, articulate a clean message that people can receive. And you know, we've got a lot to, to help you. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn or, or Nucleus or any way you can. And when you reach out to Ian, please, please, please make sure you send him a personalized connection request message and tell him that you heard him on the Modern Selling Podcast. Don't just hit connect and go. Let the man know people where you heard him at so that he actually might be willing to accept your connection request if you're one of the faithful listeners here for the Modern Selling Podcast. Ian, I got a question for you. It's uh, totally off script here, but um, question, any latest research that you guys have on the percent of sellers that are making quota? The last number I heard was 35%, down from 57%, which is the, some of those latest publications came from like, you know, I think one of them was CSO Insights before Corn Ferry, uh, you know, dismantled them. And the last time I heard was from 35% are making quota uh, this in, in the 2023 year, 2022. So tell me, do you have any latest research on that? Uh, we don't. That's a great idea, though. And uh, we're about to launch a survey. So I'm going to just I'm going to add that to our question uh, and see just how their salespeople are doing. Uh, we are looking at revenues. We're seeing certainly on the tech side, not that revenues are down. They are. But the competition is up. It's getting a lot tougher. And we're seeing deals extend. So maybe not as many uh, leaving, you know, deals falling off, but deals going really doubling in time or going up by 50%. So, yeah, I think people are missing their quota, but not right now losing the deals, but more extending the deals. But I'm going to add that to our, our survey. We're about to launch it right now. That will be great. I'd love to have that research, and we'll certainly evangelize it. Uh, and if you ever need uh, access to another database where you want to poll folks, let us know. We've got you know about 100,000 sellers, business owners, and sales leaders that are part of the database. So it would be it would be uh, fabulous because I, I could sure use that research. That's pretty interesting there. I appreciate it, Barry. Yeah, I'll absolutely I'll reach out. So uh, with that in mind, one final question. This is it, promise, and that is your all-time favorite movie, what is it? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to go old school on this, and I'm going to go with Casablanca as being the kind of the classic old uh, you've got to love it. You've got to love it for sort of its its cheesiness in a way as you look at it in this this lens of today. But it's a movie you can't get tired of. It's kind of the classic old story with some great one-liners in there. So uh, really, I'm going to fall back to that. There's a lot of great movies out there, but that's probably one of the better ones for me. Tons of great one-liners from that movie. Ian Campbell, thank you so much for joining us here on the Modern Selling Podcast. Hey, all of you listening in right now, don't turn that dial. Listen to this message right now. Thanks for listening to the Modern Selling Podcast. Please do me a huge favor and give the Modern Selling Podcast a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Oh, and don't forget, if you'd like to say 20 hours or more in a month and increase your productivity, Go right now and download Fly Message. That's flymsg.io for free. It's your free text expander and personal writing assistant. Hey, thanks for listening in. And until the next episode, good selling. <laughs>